Three, two, we're live. This is Two O F Entertainment. We are. How are you doing? doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Yeah. yeah, always big day today for you guys in the states. Well, t- well, technically it's today's Hollywood Thursday, but yes, we <laughs> t- David likes to call it this Hollywood Thursday. So we yeah. still don't know who won the election, but we do. We are doing this show on actually November fifth, which is Tuesday, but we aired on Thursday. Um, and actually, what was interesting before we hit the play button with your guest um, Steve, the artist. We were talking about politics and he was a poli sci major. So we were having a whole bunch of interesting discussions. So after you do his art, maybe at the end where I come back, we'll have a little bit of a political discussion for those people that, you know, want to see what people north of the border think. And, you know, I don't know, the people that understand what a tariff is. That would be cool. Mm-hmm. So we'll well, I think that, that would be a great segue into that for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. We have an artist um, from Toronto. Steve Fretwell, um, you, you always wonder where, what influences art and where art, art ideas come from. And Steve's work, it, it comes from war imagery, like from reconnaissance yes. photos, from the old black and white photos that airplanes would fly over top of uh, continents with, and so they could map and figure out what uh, the logistics of troop movement and, and airdrops and all these things. And you say, how do you move that kind of stuff into cosmopolitan types of work people people want to see and remember works and put in their living room or their house in their office and you say war memorabilia maybe not but you know you have to really look at what he's doing here he's an abstract artist it's phenomenal what he's doing he's you just you really have to look at um uh, and we'll talk to him about the you know where the ideas come from i mean it's we just just, just bring him in with you. I mean, we, we just <laughs> do it. Yeah, Steve, Steve, welcome to the show. Hey, um, team, how are you? Thanks for having me, fellas. Uh, you're oh, great. great. All right, now I'm going to let you two professionals talk about art. Like I said, nobody wants to hear me go like pretty colors and look at the stick figures. So I've seen your stuff. It's gorgeous. I'll see you guys at the end of the show. Enjoy the show. Cheers. Thanks. Good day to you, sir. How are you doing? I'm great, Paul. Nice to see you again. Uh, well, you know, I've seen your work for a while and then I kind of like thought we've got to have you on. I mean, you just got to, we got to talk about ideas and where ideas come from. And, you know, I, I looked at your work and you said, Oh, it comes from this, you know, we, we, uh, I guess the background being, um, recognizance photos, aerial photos of land masses, beaches, and I guess the inspiration of, um, I guess the liberation of Europe, I guess, was initially where that is. But could you give us a little bit about, I guess, where do you start with this? Where did this idea come from? And I guess they have to nurture somewhere and move to where you are now. So um, can you speak to some of that journey a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Thank, yeah thanks, for, thanks for the question. And, you know, it, it, to be really candid with you, Paul, I wish I could say I got up on Monday and figured this all out. And by Tuesday, I was at Right. It, it, did, it didn't work like that. It's a journey for many artists. Their decision um, to focus on a particular subject is influenced by a cacophony of, of inputs in their life, right? Why are to a certain piece? So it, if I rewind, and it's particularly important, I think, considering Remembrance Day is on its way here, and in the con- also in the context of the soon-to-be-lost generation of people who assisted in the liberation of Europe back in the day. So those two things are kind of on my on my mind. But <clears throat> originally, when I first started painting, I wanted to paint a subject that I could understand and I had some passion about. And it wasn't flowers or, you know, people or stick people or any of that kind of stuff. I grew up in the nation's capital. And based on my age, a lot of the, the, particularly the men, a lot of women too, but the men in my neighborhood 
who had served their country were in their kind of in their 40s to 60s, like that 20 years. So they were policemen, they were school teachers, they were plumbers, they were, they just were part of the fabric of the community. And a lot of them were really active and keep doing things for kids, the Boys and Girls Club, the Little League football, uh, they were referees, right? And they kind of had a, a way about them and a camaraderie about them that not only being, but a lot of kids in our neighborhood, right? So my mother refused to let me join the Navy or the Air Force. <laughs> like, no way, <laughs> you're not going to do that. So I sort of saw it from a from a distance, but I admired it. And the other thing that I'll, I'll I'm reminded of is that the the physical tributes to that generation in the nation's capital or any capital of any of the dem democratic nations who assisted um, is ever present. You know, the statues and the monuments and the names of the streets and the, the parades and ceremonies around Remembrance Day. Ottawa is particular because of our relationship with Holland and the, the tulips that you saw, this amazing uh, explosion of, of, of color that happened every every spring so i think i think that's where i was influenced and i began uh painting uh, i committed to paint 50 military themed portraits and by uh, about the 25th or 26th one paul i realized i don't want to be a portrait artist <laughs> no, i don't but uh since repetition is my friend and when i say i'm going to do something i prefer to do it so i powered on and in the course of doing one of those portraits, a friend of mine, I was starting to, to do social media, like an Instagram page, I had stood up, I had a LinkedIn page where I was showing my work to people. And this person gravitated to the outline sketch of an RAF pilot. And he said to me that his wife's dad, who had passed eight or nine years prior to that conversation, had served in the RAF and that he, like many Canadians, Americans, the European Brits, a lot of the times they didn't have access to the information in detail that would tell them what that person went through. Right. A lot of the times those people don't talk about it for starters. So um, <clears throat> with the recent digitization of historical records, that whole global phenomena, I knew where to look. So I took the guy's name and started to personalize this character that I was painting to at a level that I normally had not done any of my other portraits. Yeah. So I found out, for example, the day that he was shot down, where did he take off? Which was the base? Who was on his plane? What kind of plane was he flying? Who shot him down? Where he landed? Wow. Which war camp he was in? And I found a picture of his group at the prisoner of war camp. Wow. Now, as is true with many of those pictures, they have like 20 guys in the picture and there's only seven names. <laughs> so you can't, you can't really be sure who's who. But yeah. my, biggest, uh, my biggest artistic decision, Paul, was do I put a Clark Gable style mustache on my portrait? <laughs> like, you know, the old, but the guys yeah. that do. And I remembered all a lot of men in my neighborhood. In my, when I was a kid, had those little pencil mustaches. Little scratch, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you remember those guys, right? So um, I put the thing on and I showed it to my friend. And he said, I absolutely love it. I'm going to buy it from you and give it to my grandson. So his son, which had been the grandson of the character who I wrote. And that was my first sale. Wow. So as a result of that, I started to dig deeper into the RAF experience, and I was fascinated by this idea. When you think about air travel today, it's hard to find someone who's never been in an airplane. It's really difficult. Yeah. Right. I'm going to get Stephen to start our image up here. We'll just start some images up here. Here we go. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. So for example, so um, this is a good this is a good turnover. So I thought to myself, what would compel these hundreds of thousands of people to get into these machines when it was rare, very rare to happen. And then what was the emotional impact of the high frequency 
of activity that they had compared to other members of the armed forces. Okay. So with, with air aviators, particularly reconnaissance aviators, they'd go up three, four times a week. And this idea of looking down at the world from above was the foundation of the series of, of paintings that I did. My, I've been told my work is referred to as structured abstract landscape. Oh, yeah. And source material that I refer to is, as you mentioned, I think in the opening, is aerial reconnaissance photos. And of course, Paul, those are all black and white. That's true. Yeah. So for me, color, chroma, but the, the geometry I try and overly simplify. And I made a decision very early on in the From Above collection that I didn't want any obvious signs of military activity. Right. I wanted a snapshot of memory of what it would look like to look down. And in this particular painting, uh, some people have said, you know, it's a little bit of color field, the top part of it, the Jack Bush and that kind of simplicity yeah. relationship. Um, and then the water portion is interpreting the, um, the English Channel in this particular case is, again, for data. Not only when I find an aerial reconnaissance photo, I can find the weather report that went with it. That's amazing. You know, it's amazing that the research that an artist has to do to do their work. And I think people need to really understand that, that the value that goes into a piece of work that's done and the research to produce that piece of work, one piece of work, especially what you're doing is almost on an individual basis as well. So you're doing a piece of work, say, say it was a commission for somebody and you have found all the data based on that person and put it into a piece of work. Now, this piece of work could sit in your living room. You wouldn't know really what it was unless somebody saw the title or or, or, or had somebody tell you the story. And I think every picture has got a story in it, and yours is an amazing story, but it's also an encapsulated golden story. Like, it's it's a story that should be remembered for a long time and never forgotten but it's still beautiful in, in a war imagery from an abstract view looking down. I mean, when you see all the, the buildings and planes all broken up by, and, and, and I think the color injection is your interpretation of that landscape as well and at that time. So there is, you're putting in at least 50%. I mean, you've been given a, an aerial black and white to look at and interpret i think so what other information do you get when you like this one's called gold beach three uh i assume there's a one and a two somewhere down the road <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah there were so um you, you you've opened up a lot of areas of potential comment there paul and thanks for that but i want to uh, let's just focus on the the sort of geometric structure here there's three parts obviously there's the the water the beach and the land the the names of the beaches that the Allied forces used were Gold and Sword. Those were the two British beaches. Of course, the Canadian beach is Juneau. And then the Americans had Utah and Omaha. So when I interpret the beach component, the white part in between the land and the water, I colored that with gold accent. And instead of looking at the beach from 20,000 feet, it would just, just be a flat, plain surface with not a lot of color or gyration to it. I inverted the concept and thought, what would it look like at the granular level? Right. So each of those cubes, if you were all those squares, to my mind are individual grains of sand. That's why I, and that is consistent through all of the beaches. Whenever I interpret beach, I always use that pattern. And the idea of the, the, the flip and the switching of the uh, the strokes there of my palette uh, knife is the idea of creating movement through repetition. Yeah. So those are the pieces that I have in it. And um, in the aerial reconnaissance photos, some of them are from 20,000 feet. Other ones are very courageous people who flew in at a thousand or 2000. So some of them are really close up. I also get information um, depending on, you can get, images that show five days in a row 
of the same area. And the reason that I put so much blue in this is because at the in that part of Juno Beach, the Germans were flooding portions of land, controlling the water in and out as an attempt to thwart the idea of, of paratroopers landing. Yeah, they'd end up drowning. Yeah. Or yeah, exactly. So that's the first thing. also probably the movement of equipment would be really difficult in and around waterways. I exactly. Probably. And I also think, Paul, that there are people universally know when you look at a, a painting, you know, water, everybody knows where the water meets the land. Right. Everybody has an idea of what that is in, in wherever it is in the world. In this particular piece, Juno Beach 2, I, I expanded on the beach because the beach at Juno Beach is actually quite, if the tide is out, it's really quite a long distance yeah. from yeah. the from where the water's edge is up until up until the end of the beach where it turns into land. So mm -hmm. I wanted to use I used a different color to complement the um, to complement the beach on this particular piece. Uh, the geometry of the, the of the human impact on the land in that particular part of the world doesn't exactly look at like this it's sharper angles and the because these are really old farm pieces right but what i was trying to do with uh, by adding a lot of texture to my work it's hard to interpret here but you get some idea that i don't know maybe it's a half a centimeter or a full centimeter where those color fields in the land end and i wanted the texture because when you look at an aerial reconnaissance photo with a 60 degree overlap, you, I remember when I was in school and a kid, you'd look down at those stereoscopic glasses. Yeah. yeah. And you could look at the picture and it would create a three dimensional effect. Yeah. That ability to do that informed tremendously the understanding of mapping and the sizes of buildings and things. So I wanted to interpret that three dimensional effect in my actual work and also along that part of the world the french farmers would create uh fields that had high perimeters right Bocage, what the official official name of it. so have you have you have you traveled over to europe uh as well yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Did the trips and all the, the that was before i started painting um well i did i did that kind of work um <clears throat> the other thing, this one here is um, Juno Beach winter. Um, again, they're depending on the time of the winter, you would see a lot of snowfall. In this case, I I didn't do the beach traditionally. I put a silver line there. But this concept of seeing some of the vegetation from underneath is important. And as you go through other parts of Europe and get to the north of Norway and Sweden and things, the majority of the of the source imagery is done in the winter time yeah right yeah. so you get a lot of this either very subtle or very stark we're you know black and white actually probably more so black and white <laughs> yeah 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 for sure and i wanted to go back to something that you said about um earlier on about the subject matter um military subject matter is particularly challenging because a literal interpretation of it the idea of a tank or a gun or some sort of notion of conflict uh, in the literal sense, very seldom finds a way into people's homes or dining rooms or living rooms or in corporate offices, and unless they're really specifically in that field. So I wanted to interpret the material in a way that was approachable for people, that was geometrically pleasant, the color tones were modern, and I wanted the naming protocol of my work to be able to trigger some sense of memory about what those places meant. Right. And I've, I've gotten better at listening to collectors talk about once they see that they look at the painting, they oh, that's kind of interesting <laughs> or whatever goes to their mind, you know, it better than I do. And then when they get the name, you can just see the wheels start to turn. They go, Oh, Oh, okay. And then yeah. undoubtedly, somebody in the of the people that I'm talking to has a relative, a family member, somebody somewhere 
and they often recall who that person was in the context of looking at the work. So it creates an emotional compression, like a really rapid compression of emotion. And people who like my stuff, they like it right away. Yeah. I get this, just yep. like, this really works for us and <laughs> I like it, et cetera. So anyway. No, it's, uh, it's, they're inspiring, you know, and I think when you can see where things come from, where the idea of an extreme element of war, for instance, is turned into a beautiful, memorable thing, and it can be however you want to remember it or not remember it. Like, it just becomes, um, like, this is a field painting, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just lines and textures, and you you can appreciate it for what it is, uh, just a painting. And then when, and then there's just that other level, once you get it, like you said, a title or the owner of it tells them that, well, that's the name of this. This is the name of the painting. It moves it to another level. So I love paintings that slowly release the story. Like they're, they're somewhat masked and hidden. And every time you go back, you find something. Uh, I look at this one right now and I can see a sub just sitting in there, just just above the line. There's, there's, and that's just a movement of your knife or your brush and whatever. But you start seeing things, textures of water through the snow, and um, you know some of that uh, cropping that shows up through through snow mm -hmm. uh, in, in the winter time, and it will almost look like etchings. Like some of them, uh, we've done a another one with another artist years ago, and he did cropping of uh, planted different crops throughout uh, in, in a session, in a season. And it made a picture of a horse. His name was Joe Fafard. And, and it had aerial photography done of it. And as it over the season and into the winter, they were beautiful because they've cropped it. But the horse is made out of different crops, corn and wheat and canola and different things. They all crop differently. They all leave a uh, mark different on the land. And that horse was out of 60 acres in size and it was all shot, um, you know, airily through a, an airplane a photographer, a local photographer. But this is doing the same thing. It's it, it slowly releases and reveals. So in other words, you, you can't cover up a complete war. You can't ever, not even with snow, but there's still semblance of life underneath it. And I, I love that feeling of it, of, of the work. And I love the depth that a simple piece of work, it looks simple, but it's really not. It's a complicated piece. And, well, it's uh, a complicated time in our, in our history. This yeah. piece, Paul, is 48 by 48 on uh, birch gallery depth, uh, wood okay. birch, from a technique for the technicians for, for potentially listening is, you know, I'm not a small man. Uh, and when I comp I use acrylic here with a, a thickener in it, so to get the effects that you've made reference to, I'm leaning on this thing almost as hard as I can. <laughs> and the behavior of the of the uh, of the paint changes really dramatically depending on how much pressure you apply, how dry the paint is. I mean, most people know know that, but I I really kind of want to work this idea of working it in. I create a, um, I seal the back of the, the painting, like the raw wood, put a sand it down, put a sealant on it, and then I put a black base on the back. I don't want any of the wood color to come through. And then I go through this process of, of layering. I'm, I'm exploring more of that to try to capture what you've been talking about. This idea of the hand of nature against the hand of man. Right, the hand of man creates a field, right, and plants things, and then nature goes to work and and creates these different moments in time. And by adding texture to the pieces, if you look at the so the top left, there's four blocks there. You yeah. see the four. The idea of really heavy, heavy paint because nature has produced a particular spot in that field where you have some idea of a vegetation that has managed to survive throughout that, um, throughout that period. So that's Juno beach winter. Yeah. Ah, it's Kuchenhof. Yeah. Yeah. It's Kuchenhof. So um, I, I came across Kuchenhof when I was 
<clears throat> exploring this idea of how do I find beauty and grace against the backdrop of such destruction and if you think about it from above, the, these young men who were flying across Europe, a lot of what they saw below them was gray, dark, burnt out. It was not, it was not good. All smoke yeah. and it was a bad situation. And then as I explored the path that the Allies took uh, subsequent to D-Day, I came across the, the story of the liberation of Holland. And there's a strong Canadian narrative there. And as I mentioned at the beginning of our talk, Holland appealed to me on a lot of levels, not be, the least of which the number of times my mother took me out to look at all the tulips <laughs> when it was tulip festival season in Ottawa. I'd be like, oh, okay, mom. Um, but this idea of rebirth and hope that came out of the Dutch people subsequent to their liberation is both a inspiring story and it's also a story of commerce. So the Dutch farmers got together and said, we really need to focus on standing up our flower business uh, again. And they created this place called Kuchenhof Gardens. And I, in my imagination, I thought, what would Kuchenhof look like as seen from above at altitudes that they normally couldn't fly at? because. Up until the end of the war, whenever they went over Holland, they were over at 15, 20,000 feet. But as, the, as they gained control of the air, they could come across at lower elevations and able to look down at this explosion of beautiful color. So I'm, this is Kuchenhof Gold II, uh, Dutch geometry. They don't waste any space, the Dutch farmers. And the idea of flowing, moving, um, tulip fields, wildflowers done from that, the perspective of these young men who looked out the window and must have just been absolutely yeah. blown away yeah. by the color that they saw. Yeah, oh, beautiful. A lot of texture on that one too, Paul. <clears throat> there is, yeah. There is, we didn't. This one, this one's got a strong kind of grid. The other one had a horizontal gridding of a gold gridding. Yeah. Uh, and this one is more, um, structured with your green grids here and squares so landforms they almost feel like flags to me you know these these are it's a beautiful feeling there there are flags these are flags that are laying on the the surface and am i am i correct in that assumption that they yeah wasn't? yeah absolutely when you look at the uh when you look at the dutch um agricultural process and the way they put these things together they often create this idea of grid and they're each of these in my mind are 100 meter runs that's 100 meters of yellow tulips next to 100 meters of white next to 100 meters of a deep dark tulip the range of color that they produce is astonishing yeah. and but but i'm keeping in mind this is a trade show floor so people come in and say i'll take that 100 meters of tulip bulb that produces that yellow so it was a place for commerce and a place of beauty. And when viewed from above, subsequent to the end of World War II, it must have just been astonishing. And it's not perfect, the idea that flowers and the wind tend to fall on each other and they tend to move. But I wanted to keep the, the perspective of from above. So right. the, my from above series has the day before D-Day, which is the Normandy beaches, the other component of From Above is Kuchenhof, this idea of looking down at the Dutch countryside. And I didn't want to paint windmills and, you know, the typical interpretation. I wanted to keep the spirit of this idea of looking down at something from a distance. I wanted to continue to explore that. And this is an outcome. I think this one was one of the first Kuchenhofs I saw. This yeah. was 60 by 80, I think. It's oh, big. Oh, big. Yeah, I wanted it to command the wall, right? It, and it probably did. Yeah, yeah, it did. Yeah. Uh, so this is Kuchenhof, uh, Kuchenhof twelve. I was thinking about daffodils at the time. Okay. And, and this idea of yellows and grays and stuff. And I thought somebody 
I wouldn't call me. This is this one has not been sold yet. I'm surprised. I loved it so much at the beginning. I thought, oh, this is going to go quickly, but it hasn't yet. Again, you know, they're always that way. Those special ones you think will fly off the shelf, and uh, you still have them. I love. I love more so the depiction of the squares by the palette knife leaving pigment um, build up between them rather than the structured lines that you draw in which are fine this one is a really nice field piece a field painting of a fields um, but I, I love the shadows that can be created on a wall when it a cross light hits it the, the shadows change with those globules that go along the defining lines between the squares of landforms and I think it's probably more so the way it is when you when you look at things, the trees that are along a, a, a ridgeway somewhere uh, or, or a buildup of a landform, which will give you a shadow and stuff, things like that. But to work in a monochromatic pattern like this and create, is this a big painting as well? This is 48 by 48 acrylic okay. with a thickener on, um, I think this is on birch as well. So again, yeah. going back to what I was saying about pressing, the idea of pressure, and I wanted to create movement through repetition, not so much that a, uh, like the piece in the center left, which is really clear, right? Gray, you have gray, white, and that yellow tone. I was tempted to just use that again and again and again and again and again, just back and forth and back and forth. But I, I, I just didn't go that direction. I wanted this idea of the wind going across a, um, the field and the movement that happens, trying to capture that idea of motion. And you're absolutely right. When the lights go down on this painting, it changes completely. And the shadowing, because the ridges are so, I'm going to say maybe, oh, you know, at least the good. thickness of a, of a cell phone, at least. Oh. That. It's it's quite pronounced. There's a lot of painting on there. Oh, beautiful. See. You jump from a yellow palette into a really beautiful blue palette. I mean, you get this warm and this, it's still, it's a cool color, but it's, you know, I think the grays help. It's not cold. Like it doesn't feel cold to me. Uh, yeah, this one's has, this one really has the feeling of weaving to me. There's a weaving aspect to this, like your woven materials and fabric feels like fabric to me. And, uh, yeah, interesting. That's interesting. Mesh, right. You remember those old lawn chairs that used to be the mesh that you used to hold oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway, I'm just saying, way, but like, it, yeah. I could call uh, this lawn chair lawn chair twenty four. Yeah, there you go. You and I'm to. just saying the the woven aspect of this has a nice analogy to that. Like there's a nice feeling how things are woven together. And then and I and I can I just love I love and uh, just on course. that subject, Paul, when you look at uh, uh, the fields of Holland in bloom from 20,000 feet, there are separate farms. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's not just one solid place. And they do weave together like like a fabric and the notion of Dutch farming and the geometry that they used um, in this notion of linearity so that people could walk along. Interestingly, this painting was done before. Kuchenhof gold that we saw a few before. Mm -hmm. And this is where I was thinking about the golden age of Dutch uh, uh, history. The idea they were traveling the world, yeah. fantastical sailors. I was also thinking about tulip madness and the price that people were paying, right? And how this desire after such horrible conflict, the desire of the people to stand up a commercial industry of the flower industry was that's why I put the gold in is they wanted to get back to this uh, to the safety and security that commerce brought them. Yeah. No, they're well, they're well known for commerce for many centuries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah off 15. This one sold, I think 25. Was, yeah. Yeah. I think this, yeah, this one sold at a, I, I'm come. I'm just at the tail end of a really successful show, and I think this one sold at. Yes, it did. Um, again, just more playing more around more with with this idea of color, and I I purposely 
make it linearly perfect. Right? So do you, do you work up small sketches to these at all or small little pieces to figure out where you're going or do you just kind of just dive right in and, and work directly on the on the panel? Yeah, and thanks for that. Thanks for that question. I actually thought you might ask me that. So again, like I said, I didn't wake up on Monday, figure this out and start doing it on Tuesday. It took a long time for me to get the idea of the geometry together, get the source material. And it's like with many artists, trial and error, trial and error, trial and error until I found a, a rhythm. But what I would do is I would start with small pieces. Yeah. This is, you know, obviously like kind of like the size of my hand yeah. and trying to see how I could get the paint to move. So each of these boxes would have come from an idea like this. Right. The, the blue, which is in the bottom half, the alternating blue pattern. I think there is one of these kicking around somewhere. And I would lay them in like uh, swatches. I would mm -hmm. go, let me put this with this, and how does this look? And I have, don't figure it all out. Like, I'm not that really super precise. I just try and find colors that are representative of what the Dutch farmers are doing. Yeah. Right. And they have no trouble putting a crazy pink line of flowers against something that's orange or blue uh, or yellows that are not super saturated because the ground, you can see the ground coming up from under them. So have you have you ever worked with like you just showed a panel there that's inch deep or two inch, inch and a half deep? Yeah. yeah. No, it's just a thin one. OK, but, you know, you can buy this. Uh, the little panels that are made little uh well one foot squares or the six inch squares and some of those things have you ever thought of producing a whole series of those and gluing them down onto a substrate <coughs> to create you just, you just gave me more work paul <laughs> just, yeah i hadn't thought about it but you mentioned it it's sort of interesting i have sold little iterations of these or sometimes i give them away to people yeah. who buy a painting or something and in fact these studies for the lack of a better term formed um a big part of the book the coffee table book that i wrote um which is the origin story of how i started painting all 50 military portraits and then how i worked through the process of starting from this and getting to that and the book is uh it's one of those five pound coffee table Oh yeah, type of book. Yeah, beautiful book. So, is that book available still? Yes, it is. Well, there you go. We'll encourage people to look for that book and figure out how they get that book as well. Yeah, there's people can buy. It. There's two ways for people to get it. Some people buy it directly; they just want the book. Uh, but the majority of the time, I hold the books back. And if someone would buy something like Kuppenhof 15 here, at a price point over a certain amount. I, I personally autograph the book as a thank you uh, to the collector. And that's been very, very well received by people. There's only a limited number of them. They're not cheap. It's a, it's a made in Canada pro story. All the, the material, the inks, the, uh, the binding was done in Canada. And it's got a nice silver, or sorry, gold, uh, gold front to it. Yep. So it's been uh, it's been a bit of, it's a bit of a labor of love, but uh, collectors really like it who like the material and the material is um, the book is peppered with stories and explanations about what's aerial reconnaissance photograph. Yeah. No, like that's... Why? Why? What's, what's the story of Juno Beach? What's the story of Sword Beach? What role did the Americans play at Point of Hawk? Like I try to add that historical context in it. That's excellent. That's it's great background for a uh, a collector for their work. It shows that the book has been the piece of work has been published. It it also when things are published, technically, they tend to have more credibility and potentially value. They go to auction at later in life. You may not benefit from it initially in the auction market, but it does drive prices up when they uh, there's a catalog with it. You know with it being depicted in uh, with, with details about about the piece of work. That's huge mm. uh, 
and it's a great investment on your part to do it. But this one, uh, this one. Oh yeah, this one. This one was fun. Um, you know, we, we talked a little bit earlier about the, of the doing the portraits, doing the RAF guy, and finding out his story. And then I turned my attention to aviation. And I, when I looked at aviation pictures of the planes and stuff, I thought this 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 thing that you see in the center is called a roundel. And there's a whole history of roundels, and there are some really fantastic historians who know everything about every roundel that ever went on every plane. <laughs> I mean, these guys are just amazing. But what I found interesting as an artist is I looked at the roundel and I thought, this is completely opposite of what military camouflage usually is. Normally, normally military camouflage is hide. Yeah. I don't, <laughs> but this is the exact opposite. And it points your gun at this spot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I was a kid, I'm like, why do they have targets? So <laughs> the matter is that in World War I, with the advent of aviation and planes flying above, soldiers would shoot at anything they saw. So it was actually the Germans who first put an iron cross on the bottom of the wings of their airplanes. It basically says, I'm, in your, I'm on your team. The British responded with um, the Cross of St. George, but it looked too much like the German one. The guys couldn't, couldn't de 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 delineate one from the other. So the French came up with the idea of a roundel, and they had blue in the middle followed by uh, white and then red. The British adopted that during World War I and ended up with something that looks like this. This is the RAF roundel, and the important historical point of this is when you look at the side of a Spitfire or a Hurricane, the Can our Canadian aviators were the first Commonwealth country where our boys painted the silver maple to delineate that, yeah, we're with you, we're the Commonwealth, but we're our own group. Yeah. <clears throat> Subsequent South Africans and the Kiwis and all the rest of them, they ended up doing it much later on. And now every Air Force in the world has a roundel of some sort, of some color sequence. Sometimes they have something in the middle of it that delineates their, their portion of it. And I added the rivets just to sort of give it the feel of, uh, of, of uh, aircraft aluminum. Yeah. And really that's a good one, man, I, I, again i thought this one would go into a man cave almost immediately <laughs> but uh it hasn't it's still uh it's still in the market this is 48 by 48 acrylic on uh birch board yeah no yeah, it's beautiful yeah short of that being dart boards you know it's like what do you do but it's uh you know you you understand when you see this one i know right away it's it's airplane based, you know, you, you have that. And definitely this one with the flag up the leaf at the top there. But yeah. Yeah. here's one of your portraits. This is the guy I've been talking about. Yeah. Uh, you know how military people are all big on nicknames, right? <laughs> Sports teams generally have nicknames. This, uh, this is warrant officer Parsons. So if a name like Parsons, they called him snips as in parsnips. <laughs> And you can see the uh, Clark Gable type uh, mustache uh, uh, that I put on him. Yeah. And I tried to be ha accurate about the uniform and the, the, the jacket and the headgear, et cetera, et cetera. And gave him a bit of a quirky, uh, a, a quirky look. And I wanted him floating. That's why there's no hands or lower body. I have the idea of, of being suspended. Yeah. But this is where it all started for me, was uh, this painting. Yeah. No, it's, uh, you know, and I and look at portraits and it's like some people have to draw every little detail and it's got to look exactly like them, but it's a little caricature like, but it's still of the time. You know, it's just, these were tough times these guys were in, right? And it's, it's, uh, it, it evokes a, a different feeling. Like uh, there are a number of other war artists that, that do, and that's all they do is paint. Uh, portraits for the museum and such, mm -hmm. but um, in in their own style. And uh, this is this is a nice, unique style, and still depicts possibly what Snips looked like, right? <laughs> well, yeah, he's quite accurate. In fact, when his grandson got the 
the painting, he took a picture of grandpa that his father didn't know that he had. Oh, yeah. And sent it to me. And that's how I knew that the guy actually had <clears throat> a, uh, a Clark Gable mustache. Yeah, no, it's really cool. So this yeah. hangs on the wall of a young man whose grandfather served his country in, uh, he, it's in um, um, Kinneybunkport, uh, Massachusetts. Nice. Back to some landforms. Yeah, I, uh, you know, knowing a person who knows a person who knows a person is, a, is an amazing way to network and completely by accident, Paul, I saw this guy at the local gym I go to and he and I are about the same age and we started chitty chatting about how our older, how it gets harder to exercise as we get older. And I saw he had a t-shirt on once that had a map of the path that the Canadian soldiers took when they landed on the D-Day beach at Juneau on the back of his shirt. <clears throat> wow. So I said, Hey, you know, and you want the shirt off his back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I asked him, like, why do you have this shirt? And it turns out he's a an officer for the 48th Regiment that's based in Toronto. I said, oh, that's really interesting. So uh, how did you get into that, et cetera? And then we ran out of time, and I said, look, I, I, I'm an artist, and I paint these things. Here's my uh, Instagram. You know, if you find it interesting, let me know. Right? I, I'll see you next week kind of thing. So he calls me back a couple of weeks later and said, I went and looked at your work and I showed it to some people at the, uh, at the regiment and we're doing a, um, a fundraising event. And would you consider contributing a piece of work? So of course I asked him, what's the fundraising? Like, what are you trying to raise money for? And uh, he really got me when he told me this one. So the 48th Regiment Highlanders of Toronto in May of 2025, are raising money to send their pipe band to walk down the same street on the same day, playing the same song at the same time into the same village that the Canadian troops did 80 years ago when they liberated that village in Holland. Oh, nice. So yeah. as soon as he said that, I said, okay, fine. <laughs> Yeah, you have you yeah. So I asked to speak to the regimental um, historian and found out that our boys didn't uh, weren't involved in the D-Day landing. They, in fact, uh, were part of the landings in Sicily. And you know, Sicily, obviously, the uh, the land is much different. It's a desert. So the color palette that I used to interpret this code name was codenamed Sugar Beach. Um, the color palette that I used is, was different and I timed it. Um, I went back, found the aerial reconnaissance photos, tried to get an understanding a little bit about the shape of the beach and how much of it they had, uh, they had mapped out to find information about that. So this is a close up of, of that part of Sicily, just away from the shoreline. Oh, nice. <clears throat> yeah. You know, that's, uh. Um, ongoing, but, uh, you know, significant thing for, you know, 80 years. I mean, and also to do that in a memory of it uh, with the pipe band, uh, I can hear the Highlanders playing now. I think mean, that's, I think mean, the Scotsman know to me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that, that's it. Uh, a component of that, you'll see the main picture in, in a minute was I took the thread colors of the Piper's kilt I want to say it's an Anderson, but I could be wrong about the name. But these uh, four colors, and I interpreted them after a conversation with the historian. So what I said to him was, when there's a pipe band in a military setup and you're going into conflict, is the piper at the beginning, in the middle, or at the end of the troop thing? He said he's in the middle. So they protect the piper. I said, okay, so if it's a, a, a landing by beach... Do they put a piper on every one of the little boats? And he said, no, no, no. He said, it's on the troop ship. I said, how far is the troop ship from the shore? And this guy knew, seven miles. I said, <laughs> okay. So now I know that sound travels. I know sound travels across water way longer than it does in, yeah. um, in land. So I, I am in my imagination on the shoreline, 
instead of going granular, I put these lines of sound waves that would have hit the shore nice. before the boat showed up. Yeah. And it matches the, uh, the regimental kilt. Yeah. Song choice becomes really important. It's like Kelly's Heroes. you got to have the right song. Yes, and it, it, their <laughs> song of the regiment is of Highland Laddie. Uh, I'm going to see it at, this is a black tie event that's going to go on at the Royal York Hotel in Toronto. Nice. Uh, on the 17th. And here's my, again, the, this is 48 by 48 on um, birch board, gallery depth, uh, acrylic with a lot of heavy thickener in it. And I, what I did from a technique perspective is I put a heavy, heavy coat on the bottom where the water is. I then took a blowtorch. I let it dry for two weeks. Then I took a blowtorch and burnt it off. Mm. And it sanded it down, this idea of texture in the water. Um, and then put the, it's the Adriatic, so beach colors of the water are a little bit different. It's mm, yeah. over time. And then I moved to the beach, used the sound waves idea. And then I didn't put every sector on the beach because as the beach as you go further away from the beach it becomes hillier right so the reason i put the grids this notion of a repeating grid is the uh aerial reconnaissance was critical for the cartographers to create the maps that the guys on the ground would actually use yeah right yeah because right? yeah, yeah. like sector they name all their sectors, Paul, like Sector Dog, Charlie, whatever. So that's what I'm trying to interpret with the squares. Yeah, and I would imagine the geography changed as the bombings and different things happened. You had to figure out what was going on on a daily basis. Things That road all of a sudden disappeared. It wasn't there, that bridge. Well, yeah, it, absolutely, exactly. Um, now we're switching back on this painting. This goes back to the Normandy codename beaches. Right. Um, this is Sword Beach, one of the British beaches. Uh, again, if you look at Sword Beach from above, the, the, the topography is different. It's not radically different, but it's different from Omaha and Utah and, uh, and Juneau. But this is Sword. I can't remember the date that I interpreted this one, uh, but the idea here is flat calm. Right, I think the, the weather report I had. This is Omaha Beach in Omaha Beach and one of the American beaches. The beaches were divided up into sub code names. So it would be Alpha Charlie. This is Charlie section. I did this one on canvas, 48 by 48. Um, and, and instead of having the traditional, so normally I would look at it this way. This particular recon photo that I saw of it was. Um, I had that angle in it yeah. and I thought it was kind of geometrically interesting. Yeah. So well, I, yeah, coming in on an angle is, is, would they wouldn't necessarily come straight in off the water all the time. You know, they, they would come in on different angles relative to the, the gunfire that they might be receiving while they're trying to get photos. <laughs> right. And, and what I get is I'm trying to imagine these young men looking down at this and their memory of it. 30, 40, 50, 60 years later. It's yeah, the idea yeah. of you don't have granularity and a level of detail in your memory as it becomes further away. And so I didn't want to be super precise. I just wanted this idea of close your eyes and think about it for a fraction of a second and open it up. And what do you grab? The basic yeah. components, right? Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's quite a striking piece. It's quite, there he is. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm back. Who oh, no. knew? So that was very cool. I and the story behind it of everything I thought was very interesting as well. And I like the big book because um, you know you don't have to color outside the lines. So <laughs> my question is that I ask every artist that we have on the show, what's your what's your work range from from what to what? If somebody sees this and goes, I have to have a piece, what are they going to spend roughly? Yeah. So currently, um, I'm coming off a really successful uh, show at a gallery okay. in Cambridge, Ontario, uh, called Langdon Hall. Um, things went better for me there, Steve, than I thought that they okay. were. I'm quite happy about that. So right now, a 48 by 48 for me 
you're looking at somewhere around $3,300. Canadian. Yeah. Well, in U.S., I keep I keep the number the same, whether it's in euros or, oh, okay. or U.S. dollars. Just it's easier for me. There's a bit okay. of a currency um, of, uh, advantage to me at this point, but I find at that price point, um, people who get it, right. who attach to what you were saying earlier, they get right. the emotional connection to Omaha because Uncle Charlie's on like, right, right, and they know. As I was saying to Paul. This work can be in the living room, right. or it can be in the den, or it can be in the family room, or it can be in the office because it's not in its geometry and color and feeling. It does not scream military. Right. So, so what is your what is your what does your coffee table book go for? If somebody wants, my coffee buy. table book is available for two hundred dollars if you buy it straight up, but if you buy a forty-eight by forty-eight. Um, I've set aside enough of them that I'll include the book. Yeah, wow. Well, you autograph the book. Personally autograph the book. All right. Yeah. There you go. So, what and a bonus. Yeah. What's that? I know. That's a bonus. a bonus. It's a lot of bonus and a yeah. great mistake. It's yeah. a twofer. Come on, stop. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is a twofer and it's limited. It's a limited edition. Um, right. Well, the cost to produce those books, people don't understand. They're they're very expensive. That's expensive. The cost to produce the book costs two hundred dollars. So I mean, it's like it's an expensive book to to do. And today, it's gone. Yeah. It's actually book production has doubled. Like unless you're going oh. offshore, to have right. your books made, um, paper production, everything. And as Stephen said before, if Trump gets in next year, it's going to double again. <laughs> That's right. So it won't matter for us. It will. For you guys, we're not sure. So we'll we're not. We'll see. That was the off-air discussion we were talking about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Is our election day? So this is very apropos because of what today is um, here in America. So, it is. It is. And in fact, great. guys, in our in our in our lifetime, hopefully, right. in our lifetime, this generation of people who did so much to push back the most horrible forces of of humanity known to mankind, they're not going to be with us anymore. That's true. I, think, I, I can't remember the exact number, but the number of American survivors who actually participated in D-Day, now that's 41, is right. below 100, I think. Yep. And then yep. depending on their ages, when they got involved near the end of the war, the people who served their country, and that served their country not only in the sense of you know being in a uniform, but building uh, springs or in Detroit or, or uh, wooden aircraft in the north of England or whatever. Those people are about to go to the next life. And when I listen to people who collect my work, they find the geometry interesting, the colors interesting, uh, but it's, it's the way they connect to the values of that generation. And they want to own something that reflects that, what those people did in a way that can be welcoming in their home. Not, we call it, not too obvious. Right. We just call it old school. <laughs> uh, that's basically what it is. The old it's we we have a cigar show and we talk about just it's old school. It's old world. There's a different value, a different tradition. And so people that connect with your work, they're looking at a different value, a different tradition, a different everything. It's not today where everybody's on their phone. Nobody cares. Back then, people actually spoke to each other because you had no choice. So it's a much different yeah. mentality. So it just brings you back to a, a different, it's better or worse time, it's personal opinion, but a different time mm -hmm. where people actually yeah. cared about people and not cared about everything else that was going on. Yeah. And, you, you know, I mentioned, I mentioned this idea of people connecting emotionally. I do commission work. Okay. For people. And I had a, a, a family, I did a 60 by 80 of Juno Beach, and I had the, right. the flight log book of the, the guy's father. So I wow. knew which day he flew over Juno Beach, right. and right. I knew the weather report. So I had some data to go on, and, the, and that painting is in their dining room. And beside the painting is a shadow box of the old boys' medals. Oh, wow. And it serves as a conversation piece for the family to right. be reminded of these, of these types of things. Yeah. So I'm really touched when people ask me to do stuff like that. Like I like right. that work, and, and the, detail is, uh, the detail is important. Very cool. Well, your stuff is absolutely gorgeous. So we'll have all Stephen's links below.
Um, if you want to reach out to them, do that. If you can't figure out how to click a link, reach us out to show. We'll put you in touch with them. You know, some of our fans, eh, not the sharpest tools in the shed, um, but uh, we'll help you get in touch with Stephen, not to worry. Um, and his his interview will be here forever, so you can enjoy his work if you don't want to buy it or can't afford it. There you go. If you want his book, um, I would say reach out for that as well because that's you know that has everything in it. So there you go, Stephen. Sure. Thank you so much for being here. We greatly appreciate it. Hope to see you again soon after another successful show. Um, and so we'll remind everybody like a year from now, you could have bought it at 33 and now it's 66. So, you know, that's, uh, that'll be very good. So gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Everybody, thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and like, and Paul will be back next Thursday with somebody. Cheers, everybody. Thank you, guys.